On Divine Fear by Abba Dorotheos of Gaza St. John says in one of his Catholic epistles, Perfect love casteth out fear. What, one wonders, does the saint wish to point us to by this? About what sort of love and what sort of fear is he actually speaking? The prophet says in a psalm, O fear the Lord, all ye his saints. And we find a myriad of other such statements in the Holy Scriptures. If now, even the saints, who so love the Lord, fear him, why does St. John say that love casteth out fear? The saint wishes to indicate to us that there are two kinds of fear, one initial and the other perfect, and that, while one is characteristic of neophytes, as we say in the spiritual life, the other is characteristic of the holy, of those who have been made perfect spiritually and have attained to a measure of holy love. Heed what I am saying. One does the will of God out of fear of punishment. He, as we have said, is a total neophyte. He does not strive on account of goodness itself, but because he fears chastisements. The other does the will of God because he loves God, and since he especially rejoices when his life is pleasing to God. He knows the essence of goodness. He has tasted of what it means for one to be united to God. This is the one who has the true love that St. John calls perfect. And this love leads him to perfect fear. For he fears and does the will of God, not out of fear of chastisements, not out of fear of perhaps going to hell, but, just as we have said, because he has tasted of the sweetness experienced by those who are united to God and fears that he might be deprived of it. Thus, this perfect fear, which comes forth from love, distances us from initial fear. And for this reason it is said that, Perfect love casteth out fear. Nonetheless, it is impossible for one to arrive otherwise at perfect fear, save by initial fear. For there are three dispositions of the soul, as St. Basil the Great tells us, by which we can be pleasing to God. That is, we can be pleasing to God either when we fear damnation, and therefore find ourselves in a situation of a slave, or fulfill the commandments of God because we seek the gain that we will receive as a reward from God for our personal benefit, and at this point we resemble a hireling, or for goodness itself, thus finding ourselves in the position of a son. Now, a son, when he reaches the age of maturity, does the will of his father, not out of fear of being spanked, or to receive some reward from him, but because he especially loves him and respects him, sure in knowing that all that his father has is also his. He will be made worthy to hear the words, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Such a one surely no longer fears God without initial fear, but loves him. As St. Anthony the Great says, I do not fear God because I love him. And as the Lord said to Abraham, after the latter offered to sacrifice his son, For now I know that thou fearest God. It is this sort of fear that is meant, fear that comes into the soul from love. God forgive me for the thought, but how could God have said, Now I know? Abraham did so much. He obeyed God and left all that he possessed to go to a foreign land and an idolatrous people where there was not even a trace of godly piety. And on top of all that befell him, he was sent the terrible temptation to sacrifice his son. Only after all of that, he was told, Now I know that thou fearest God. It is obvious that it was perfect fear that God meant, that fear that the saints have. The saints do not do the will of God out of fear of punishment or to receive reward, but because... As we have repeatedly said, they fear to do something not in accord with the will of their beloved. Thus it is said that love casteth out fear. For they no longer keep the law of God out of fear, but have fear because they love. This is perfect fear, though one cannot attain to such perfection, as we said earlier, unless he first acquires initial fear. For it is said, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. 
And again it is said, Fear of God is the beginning and the end. By beginning is meant the initial fear by way of which one succeeds at perfect fear, the fear which the holy have. Initial fear corresponds to our spiritual state. It protects the soul from every evil in the same way that tin plating protects copper. Indeed, it is said, by the fear of the Lord, everyone departs from evil. If then one sets aside evil by way of fearing punishment, like the slave who fears his master, he slowly comes to the point of doing good. And by doing good, he begins, bit by bit, to hope for some enumeration for his work, just as a hireling does. When, then, one persists in setting aside evil, as we said, out of fear, as a laborer does, and also continues to do good out of an expectation of remuneration, just like the hireling, abiding by the grace of God in his effort to do good for a sufficient amount of time and drawing nearer to God, he finally tastes in accordance with his progress of the divine presence, and he no longer wishes to be far from God. As the Apostle Paul says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He then achieves the status of a son, loving goodness for the sake of goodness itself, and fears because he loves. It is this precisely that great and perfect fear is. For this reason, teaching us about the difference between these two kinds of fear, the prophet David said, Come ye children, hearken unto me, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Pay attention to every word of the prophet, taking care to see that his every word has power. At the very onset he says, Come unto me, inviting us to virtue. He also adds the word children. The saints call children those who by their words are converted from evil to virtue, as the Apostle Paul says, My little children, of whom I travail and birth again until Christ be formed in you. Afterwards, having invited us and urged us to be so converted, the saint says, I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Do you see the saint's boldness? We, when we want to speak of goodness, always say, Would you like that we speak a little and go deeper into what fear of God or some other virtue means? The holy prophet, however, did not speak in such a way, but boldly said, Come, my children, and hear me, and I will teach you about the fear of God. What man is he that desireth life, that loveth to see good days? Thereupon, as though someone had answered, I want you to teach me how to live, that I may see good days, he instructs him, saying, Keep thy tongue from evil, and thy lips from speaking guile. Behold how he immediately slashes away at the force of evil with the fear of God, to stop your tongue from speaking and from saying unbefitting words not to wound your neighbor's conscience with some word, not to gossip, and not to drive anyone to anger. And keep your lips from speaking in a deceitful way means not to cheat your neighbor. He next adds, turn away from evil. He first mentions several sins, gossip and guile, and then concludes generally with all of the other evils by way of saying, turn away from evil. That is, to put it succinctly, he tells us to flee from every evil and turn away from everything that leads to sin. And he did not say just this, then falling silent, but he said in addition, do good. For at times one does no evil, yet also does no good. He is not unjust, but neither is he merciful. He does not hate, but also does not love. The prophet spoke well, therefore, turn away from evil and do good. Thus he shows us, in turn, the three foregoing states of which we spoke. With fear, that is, one directs the soul far from evil and exhorts it to rise to the realm of goodness. For if someone is vouchsafed to cease doing evil and withdraws from it, in a natural way he does what is good, with the guidance of the saints. Having said this well, the prophet continues, stating in addition, Seek peace and pursue it. Indeed, he said not only seek it, but pursue it in order to acquire it. 
Note well this verb and observe the precision of the saint. When one has been vouchsafed to turn away from evil and striving together with God, becomes accustomed to doing good, there immediately resume in him the assaults of the enemy against him. Therefore he struggles, labors, and is worn down, not just because he fears to return to what is evil, as we said earlier about the hireling, but also because he expects, like a hireling, that he will receive his reward for his good deeds. Thus, by being assaulted and battling and exchanging blows with the enemy, he does what is good, though with considerable distress and tumult. When, taking aid from God, he begins habitually to do good, then he is in the side of rest, then he progressively savors peace. He then knows what tumult and war mean, and what the joy and gladness of peace mean. It is then that he seeks peace, struggles for it, and runs in pursuit of it, in order finally to capture it and to establish it in his soul. Who, therefore, is more blessed than that soul who is made worthy of this height? He is, as we have said repeatedly, one who stands in the stead of a son. For, indeed, blessed are they who seek peace, for they shall be called the sons of God. What more than anything else can persuade such a soul to do good, if not the enjoyment of that very good? Who knows this joy, other than he who has savored it? Thereupon, as we have repeatedly said, he knows perfect fear. We have now heard what the perfect fear known to the saints is, and what the initial fear of those in our own state is, where one begins and where one arrives by way of the fear of God. It remains for us to learn where the fear of God comes from and what things alienate us from it. The fathers have said that one acquires the fear of God by constant memory of death and of eternal punishment, by examining himself at the waning of every day as to how he passed the day, and every morning as to how he passed the night, by not being audacious and by dwelling with someone else who truly fears God. It is said, indeed, that a brother asked a certain one of the elders, What can I do, Father, in order to have fear of God? And the elder told him, Place yourself under submission to someone who lives in fear of God, and you too will learn to fear him. Yet we drive the fear of God far from us, doing all that is antithetical to what we have noted, that is, by not keeping in mind the memory of death, an eternal punishment by failing to attend to ourselves and not examining how we are faring, by living insouciantly and associating with those indifferent to spiritual things, and even by showing bold self-assurance, which is the worst of all. This is complete ruination. What also removes the soul from fear of God is bold self-assurance. For this reason, when Abba Agathon was asked about bold self-assurance, he said that it resembled a great heat wave from the face of which, when it comes, everyone flees and takes cover, and which ruins all of the fruit on the trees. See, my brothers, what power this passion has. And when the Abba was asked again, is bold self-assurance really such a dangerous passion? He replied, there is no passion worse than bold self-assurance since it is the mother of all passions. Very well, and with much prudence did he say that bold self-assurance is the mother of all the passions, for it drives the fear of God from the soul. Indeed, if the fear of God distances one from all evil, then certainly wherever there is no fear of God, one finds every sort of passion. May God rescue our souls from the catastrophic passion of bold self-assurance. And bold self-assurance is expressed in a variety of ways. One can show bold self-assurance in words, by touch and with a glance. One can come to bold self-assurance by way of prattle, discussions of worldly matters, and making jokes that culminate in indecorous laughter. Bold self-assurance is expressed in touching someone needlessly, to reach out one's hand to someone in jest, to push someone, to snatch something, to glance at someone in a cocky manner. All of these give way to bold self-assurance. 
They come about because there is no fear of God in the soul. And from these things, one ends up, bit by bit, in complete contempt. For this reason, when God gave the commandments of the law, he said, Cause the children of Israel to beware. Without pious wariness of our own actions and thoughts, we neither honor God himself nor do we heed, even once, any commandment whatsoever. Therefore, there is nothing more destructive than bold self-assertion. It is the progenitor of all the passions. It alienates one from pious wariness. It drives away the fear of God, and it spawns contempt. It is because you have self-assurance amongst you that you have no respect and speak in an ugly manner, wounding one another. If one of you sees something that is not beneficial and, departing, gossips about it, putting it into the heart of another brother, you harm not only yourself but your brother, having placed in his heart the deadly seeds of evil. Many times, while a brother is focused on prayer or some other good thing, another will go to him and burden him with some issue, and this not only impedes what is to his spiritual benefit, but brings him temptation. There is nothing more perilous than for one to harm not only himself thusly, but also others. Let us have pious wariness, my brethren, and let us fear causing damage to ourselves and to others. Let us honor one another and let us take such care that we do not so much as raise our eyes to the face of others. For this too, as one of the elders has said, is a form of bold self-assurance. If it so happens that someone should see his brother sin, he should neither turn away from him nor remain silent, leaving him to be destroyed. On the other hand, he should neither embarrass nor vilify him, but with compassion and fear of God refer the matter to someone who is in a position to correct him, or himself speak to the brother with love and humility, saying, Forgive me, my brother, since, as a man, I have not learned to see my own ruinous state, but allow me to observe that we are not acting correctly in this instance. And if the brother does not listen to him, let him speak with someone else, whom his conscience reveals to be pious. Let him consult the brother's superior or the abbot, commensurate with the magnitude of the infraction, and let him then fall silent. But, as we have said, let him speak with the goal of correcting his brother and not to gossip, to vilify, or to demean him, without condemning him and without pretending that he wants to correct the brother, when in fact he has within himself one of the ill intentions that we have mentioned. Indeed, in actuality, if someone says something to a brother's elder himself, without doing so with a desire to correct his neighbor, but because he has something against his neighbor, this is a sin, it is gossip. If one examines his heart, finding some spiteful proclivity, then he should not speak. If, however, one observes meticulously within himself that he wishes to speak out of sympathy and for the benefit of his brother, but is impeded by some spiteful thought within himself, let him humbly mention to the elder his own sin, along with that of his neighbor, saying, My conscience tells me that I want to speak for the sake of my brother being corrected, yet I sense within myself entangled thoughts, whether because I have harbored something against my brother or because some false thought seeks to prevent me from saying something for his correction, I do not know. The elder will then tell him whether he should speak or not. At times, one says something without aiming to benefit his brother, or to confess that he is bothered by him, or because he harbors some malice, but simply to prattle out of a garrulous disposition. But why is such babble needed? Indeed, Often a brother will learn what has been said of him in such discussions and will become upset and grieved, thus amplifying this evil. For when one says something solely to benefit his brother, God does not let the brother become upset or allow any aftermath of grief or harm. Struggle, therefore, as we have said, to control your tongue so that no one says anything bad about his neighbor. Let no one hurt anyone at all in deed or word, whether by his actions or some other means. Nor should you be irascible 
such that when you hear some statement about yourself from a brother, you become angry or respond to him in an ugly way or remain upset with him. That is not a trait of someone who is a spiritual struggler. One who wishes to be saved does not do these things. Acquire the fear of God, but with respect for others, so that when you encounter a brother, each of you lowers his head, as we stated, humbling himself before God and his brother, and cutting off, for his brother's sake, his own will. In fact, it is a praiseworthy thing for one to relinquish his position to his brother and to give him preference. It benefits the one who does the relinquishing more than the recipient. I do not know if I have ever done anything good, but if the grace of God has always covered me, I know that I have been protected by that fact that I never favored myself over my brother, but always put my brother first. While I was still in the monastery of Abba Cerritos, the attendant of Abba John the Elder, the disciple of Abba Barsanufius, fell ill, and my elder gave me a blessing to go serve the ailing Elder John. I would kiss the outer door of his cell in the very same way that one would venerate the Holy Cross. Indeed, how pleased I was to look after him. For who would not want to be found worthy to serve such a saint? Every day, in fact, he spoke so wondrously. And always, as I completed my duties, I would make a prostration before him in order to take his blessing and leave. And he always said something to me. For the elder had four apothems, and, as I said, every evening as I was about to leave, he would without fail convey one of these to me, speaking to me thusly, Above all else, my brother, may God sustain love. For in uttering each saying, it was his custom to use this phrase. The fathers have said, Taking care not to scandalize your neighbor's conscience begets humility. The next evening, he would say to me, Above all else, my brother, may God sustain love. The fathers have said, I have never placed my own will before that of my brother. Another day, he would say, Above all else, my brother, may God sustain love. The fathers have said, Flee the things of man and be saved. Yet another day, he would say, Above all else, my brother, May God sustain love, bear one another's burdens, and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Each evening when I left, he would always convey an exhortation to me from one of these four apothems, as though giving me some resource, and thus I have had them to protect me throughout my life. Nonetheless, despite acquiring such peace when with the saint and being so desirous to serve him, the moment that I sensed that another brother, because he also desired to serve him, was upset, I went to the abbot and implored him, saying, It is better, perhaps, if you bless, that this other brother should serve the elder. But the abbot did not give his blessing, nor did the elder himself. Despite this, thereafter I did what I could to placate the brother. During the nine years that I stayed there, I do not recall speaking disagreeably to anyone, even though I was continually serving, lest anyone think that I had no reason to do so. And believe me, I remember a brother following me from the infirmary all the way to the church, belittling me. I walked in front of him without saying a single word to him, but when the elder learned this, I do not know who told him, and wanted to chastise him, I fell at his feet and said, for the love of the Lord I was at fault. What fault did the brother have? And someone else, over a long period of time, would, whether because of some temptation or simple-mindedness, God knows which, urinate on my pillow at night, even soaking my bedding. Similarly, several other brothers would come to the front of my cell each day to shake out their rush mats, and I would see such a plethora of bed bugs come into my cell that I knew I could never kill all of them. There were so many of them on account of the immense heat. So, when I would lie down to sleep, they all gathered on top of me. And having fallen asleep from my great exhaustion, when I awoke from sleep, 
I would see that my entire body had been bitten by them. But I never told any of them, Do not do that, or Why do you do that? As I said before, I do not recall myself ever saying anything to wound or to sadden anyone. Teach yourselves to bear one another's burdens. Learn to have respect for one another. And if, moreover, any among you should hear a word from someone that does not please him, or should someone defy him, do not immediately take it to heart or be provoked, lest at a time of contest, put before you for your benefit, you be found faint-hearted, imprudent, unable to accept any offense whatever, like a melon that, the moment a small rock rubs against it, becomes bruised and rots. It is better to have a stout heart and be long-suffering so that love might prevail against you in all things that occur. In addition, if someone is fulfilling an obedience, and it so happens that he needs to ask something of the gardener, or the monk who looks after the monastery provisions, or the cook, or, in short, any of his fellow workers, both he who is asking for some service and the server who undertakes it should maintain, above all, their constant affable and ironic state. And they should never allow themselves to deviate from the commandments of God or give themselves over to upset, passionate dislikes or likes, or to any other desire or entitlement. Rather, whatever should happen, whether of small or great importance, let us not show undue concern about it, and let us not give it great regard. Of course, indifference is a bad thing, but neither is it, once more, a good thing for one to become so preoccupied with something that happens that he loses his ironic disposition, such that the soul is harmed. Because, in whatever obedience you may undertake, and even if it is urgent and important, I do not wish you to do anything that occasions squabbling and upset, but to be convinced that every task that you fulfill, great or small, as I earlier said, is but an eighth of what is asked of us. Indeed, to maintain your peace, even if thereby you should fail at your obedience, is four-eighths, or half, of what has been asked of you. Do you see the difference? Therefore, if you undertake some task, and you wish to do it perfectly and fully, take care to do it perfectly, which is, as I said, an eighth of the task, but also take care to keep your internal state unharmed, which is four-eighths of the task. If, however, for some reason you drift away from or violate this command, and you or another suffers harm, you have gained nothing, since, in fulfilling your obedience, you are losing four-eighths, i.e., your irenic disposition, for the sole purpose of protecting the one-eighth, i.e., the completion of your task. If you see someone doing such a thing, rest assured that he is not doing his obedience with proper understanding. For whether out of vanity or desire for their positive regard, he wrangles with others in order to show that no one can get the better of him. He brings chastisement on himself and his neighbor. Alas, some great feat! This is not a victory! This is harm and destruction. I give you a command that, if I should happen to send anyone among you to do any obedience whatever, and you should see any disturbance or harmful thing at all arise, cease immediately. Never harm yourself or others, but stop your work. Let no such thing come about. Simply never become agitated. For, as I said, if you do so, you lose the four-eighths for the sake of the one-eighth. It is wholly obvious that this is senseless. I tell you these things not that you should immediately become irresolute and transgress your obediences, or all at once ignore and set everything aside, trampling on your conscience, since you want to live carelessly. Nor, furthermore, so that you may disobey and each of you say, I cannot do that, since, not being suitable for me, it will bring harm on me. With this pretext, you will do no obedience, 
and neither will you ever be able to keep the commandments of God. But I tell you this so that you can place all of your strength toward the end of doing every obedience with humility, submissively, and honoring and comforting one another. Nothing is more powerful than humility. But should one yet see, at some moment, his neighbor or himself aggrieved, stop, back down, and do not persist to the point that there ensues spiritual harm. For it is better, and I say this a thousand times over, for some work not to come about as you wish, and as circumstances demand, than contumaciously or according to one's prerogative, since it is obvious that the latter course will upset you and grieve others. You will thus lose the four-eighths. And there is a great difference in the harm done. Many times, indeed, it happens that one loses even the one-eighth and accomplishes absolutely nothing. These things are the consequences of contentions. Let us hold to this principle, that is, in all of the jobs that we do, let us do them with a goal of benefiting from them. However, what are the benefits if we do not humble ourselves, one to the other, but instead continue to trouble and displease one another? And you are aware of what is said in the writings of the elders. Life and death depends on our neighbor. You should contemplate these things within, my brethren, so as to be versed in the words of the holy elders, taking care, with love and fear of God, to seek what is beneficial to you and to others. In that way you can gain profit and make progress, by the grace of God, in all that you do. And so our God, the lover of mankind, will grant you fear of him. For it is said, Fear God, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole man. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, of Abba Dorotheos of Gaza, O Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us. Amen.